today I'll be your moderator. It's a great pleasure. My name is Ali El Jabri. I'm a professional moderator and presenter, former TV correspondent for Associated Press. The title of our session is, after I say the title, we bring in some more enthusiasm and then you'll applaud. How about that? Okay. So the title is, what can the social economy and social innovation contribute to the design, use, and monitoring of AI? We're setting the bar quite high, <laughs> as you can see. Um, interpretation, as mentioned before, is available, English, French, and German. There's also international sign language and subtitles provided by humans. I think we're not supposed to hear that. <laughs> and now he's saying we're not supposed to hear this. <laughs> so the format of our get together is as follows. We'll have three short presentations. Let's hope the sound man can take care. Also of the little disturbance in my microphone and the German interpretation. So there'll be three. <laughs> There'll be three short presentations and they will be followed by a open discussion with all of us. And you're highly, highly encouraged to participate because I'm quite sure you are curious, but you also have quite a, a lot of knowledge to bring to the table. To participate, if you are in the room, we encourage you to raise your hand and speak in the microphone. If you're more comfortable to use Slido, then please do so like the online audience. Perhaps at some point we can show the Slido QR code. Please send in your questions at any time that you prefer. The questions will be passed on to me. They'll appear in my tablet, but they also appear on the screen. You also have the option to vote for the question that you like. And I'll try to entertain as many of your questions as the time allows. Now, I'll give you a little more details on the focus of our panel. One of the central questions we want to raise in the session is who should monitor the use of AI? An obvious answer is, of course, government. Another answer is the private sector, who should we expect of them ask the question, what is an ethical way of applying AI? But in this ses session, we focus on a third, perhaps sometimes less likely option, but important nonetheless, and that is civil society and the social economy sector. Just in case you're not entirely familiar with the idea of the social economy, here's a short video. The social economy is a special kind of economy putting people before profit. Driven by collective interests, social and environmental goals guide economic activity. Social economy organizations are active in almost all sectors. Organizations include cooperatives, associations, mutual benefit societies, foundations, and social enterprises. Building on local roots, the social economy is based on solidarity and participation. It aims to serve people, and the planet by putting profit back into communities, creating jobs and opportunities. The social economy landscape is diverse, with over 2.8 million organizations in Europe providing over 13.6 million jobs. For more information, visit ec.europa.eu slash social slash social economy. I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar, at least with a few social economy enterprises. Uh, an example, and uh, excuse my French, it's not very good, Le Petit Rien in Belgium, and Tony Chocolonely, the chocolate, and uh, care services provided by such organizations as Caritas. The European Commission adopted the action plan for the social economy in 2021 with a time horizon for implementation until 2030. If you want to learn more, on this, please visit so the Social Economy Gateway. A link should appear in the chat as I speak. What do we mean when we talk about social innovation? We refer to new ideas that meet social needs, create social relations, and form new collaborations. This could be particularly important in the way we design, use, and monitor artificial intelligence with a collaborative approach 
involving all relevant stakeholders. This has better chance of getting it right than the old-fashioned top-down way. Now that you have a better understanding of the focus of our session, allow me to introduce our excellent speakers to you, and I'll start from my left. Sitting next to me is Mireya Ora de Salsa. She's a political scientist, but she's also studied law and is soon a lawyer, and she works for Eticas Foundation in Spain. Then at the other end is sitting Frank Victor Roland. He's co-founder of Wequity Belgium. He was coding since he was 12, but he also studied law. So that's a perfect combination for the topic that we have. Then we have two ladies from Finland sitting right in the middle. The one who's closer to me is uh, Lina Toivanen. She has a Master of Business Administration. And sitting next to her is Maria Lisa Hironen. She has a doctorate in economics and is also a nurse. And at this moment, they are both the RDI coordinators at the Center Centria University of Applied Sciences in Finland. And even more enthusiastic applause for our speakers than the first one. Now we have three presentations, as I explained. The first will deal with tough questions that relate to AI, and the second and third presentation will be uh, a different use case of AI. The first will be about in the context of impact investing, and the second will relate to the social innovation context. The first presentation will be by Mireya. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ali. Um, well, thank you for the invitation. and. Just to say, if my English is not perfect, sorry. Um, but if you need any clarification, please uh, let me know. So yes, I'm Mireya. I'm coming from Ethica Step. I'm just waiting for them to put on the slides. Um, thank you. Um, Ethica was born 10 years ago um, with a concrete mission that was creating the ecosystem of grantees that could protect the people and recently we added the environment in technological processes. That's why we call us the symbols of IA and it's basically uh, making sure that technology has all these checkpoints um, where we need to control and mitigate any risks or harms that could be um, impacting society. Um, I really like the example that Gemma Galdon, uh, Ethicus founder and CEO, um, always uh, tells that is basically when we eat uh, yogurt, we know that this yogurt is not going to kill us because from the cow to the um, transport until the, the storage in the supermarket, we know that this yogurt has been protected and that has been like checked and monitored. Um, because we don't, we don't want people to be killed because they eat a yogurt, right? So basically we do the same with technology. This ecosystem of grantees that we to protect the yogurt and to make sure that it is um, good for people, um, we don't have it right now with technology. So Ethicus has been testing during these last years different exercises or checkpoints that could or could not work to check the consequences and see how to mitigate any uh, damage or harm made by technological products. So next slide. Um, basically, from five years ago, um, we were concretely focused in one exercise that is adversar adversarial and internal auditing, algorithmic auditing in general. Um, basically, because we saw that uh, could really work to uh, detect um, different harms and risks associated to any system that was already um, prepared to be like to fully operate or that was already operating. Um, internal audit, we call internal audit for any analysis that we do for uh, systems or like a company that comes to us and say, please, can you analyze this system? So we check through a methodology that we develop. And then we call adversarial auditing for those situations where, for example, public administration doesn't release any information regarding the system. So we do like through different methodologies related to reverse engineer from the output that this algorithm or this system is producing, we can just like have a clue on how um, the system works and see if there's potential discrimination um, and harms associated. Um, then apart from algorithmic auditing, we've been testing different exercises that could have like these different positive results uh, in terms of transparency, um, in terms of more, yeah, 
clarity on how these systems were operating. Um, so one of them, um, and that's why we created, if you want to go to the next slide, um, the Observatory um, uh, of Algorithms of Social Impact was pretty much focused um, on, we cannot assess something that we not, don't know if it exists or not. So for instance, one of the first challenges that we had at Eticas, which is like, how can we know that the public administration is using algorithms if they are not releasing or not revealing if they apply or not an algorithm to solve a particular situation. So that's why uh, we created the observatory with the M like for everyone to collaborate and just like have like a big list of algorithms. We categorize um, them into like a quick, well, uh, just like general um, ways of categorizing, so like topic, the impacted community, if there was like some legal case um, that the algorithm was going through, if it was the public administration or some company that was managing the algorithm. So different like general topics um, in order to see or to have like a bit general tendencies in terms of just like the um, like the, uh, the exponential use, let's say, um, of algorithms um, in our societies. So that's pretty much the, the tool here. You can see like the first part of the algorithm is public. Uh, you can check in our website and, and um, check anything related to the algorithm. And one of the things after having this um, observatory or this table with different algorithms map, it's just like, okay, now we know that they exist, but we don't know exactly the consequences that they are having on society. Because most of them, they, there's no information regarding if it has been audited or if it has been passed like some exercise to check if there's some harms or discrimination happening. Um, and the companies and also the public administration, we were going there and ask, please, can you say like if it has been passed an impact assessment, who has been involved um, in taking the decision of applying an algorithm in this particular situation, in which context is operating, why are you using this system? like the answer was just like silence and no information was revealed. So from there, then um, we said, okay, now we have a register and it's quite good because in terms of transparency, it allows us to know exactly the algorithms that are already operating and having or causing com like different consequences in terms of society. But now we need to go a step farther um, and make sure that with all of this new regulation, um, there's the checkpoints um, in place. So in the future, our hope is that this um, register can also have, like, if it has been audited or not, the results of the audit and, like, the diff different checkpoints included. Um, if you go to the next line, and I'm going to go to the... Well, here it is, like, you'll have the slides then, but the algorithm currently have 152 algorithms um, in the table. And then here we did, just, like, after one year of having the algorithm, we just, like, assess different general tendencies so you can see that the main domain that algorithms are being applied are in for policing and security, which is a bit scary. Um, and then the second is social services that is uh, more uh, focused on the topic that brings us here today. Then in terms of discrimination, there's a lot of potential discriminations associated with the impact um, of the algorithm being applied. So there's like socioeconomical, racial, gender, um, being the three that are more, or that we, mm, guess that can be more um, uh, included in the different systems analyzed. Then in terms of impact, well, we analyzed in terms of threat to privacy and state surveillance. If it was like a, a step further in terms of state surveillance and there also like why these um, algorithms were being used um, and uh, mainly like all of them were just like focused on profiling and, and also predicting human behavior. Um, so I'd well, just like to give you a quick context on like the different, the big tendencies that we got from these um, 150 uh, algorithms included in the table. And if we go to the last slide, um, basically when we talk about the design of IA algorithms from the knowledge that we got for internal, like from the exercises that we already concluded in terms of internal auditing and adversarial auditing, um, there's like four main points that I would like to, to bring here into the conversation that we from ethics, we think that um, can be really four points that can make a positive impact on the design, use, and monitoring of IA systems. One, the first one is we always call uh, algorithmic auditing end-to-end um, -end and socio-technical exercises. End-to-end, um, -end, when I say end-to-end, -end, it's basically um, we need exercises that checks the context in which this system is operating 
if we don't, or if we just go and check the code, the source code of the algorithm is not going to um, give us um, any, pro probably any concerns or potential discrimination associated, and that's been mentioned already in different sessions in this conference. So basically, we, under we understand that we need to check the, the system acting in a particular context. In order to do that, we need to know exactly who has been involved in all the, the um, decision-making process of applying this algorithm, who has been deciding the different technical specifications, who has been in charge of deciding which data sets are going to be um, included in the system. Obviously, we check the code source, but then we also check, is there any um, appealing mechanism that is in place in order to make sure that if somebody that is impacted by the algorithm is not agreeing with the, with the output can raise the hand and say, no, this is not what I think, I'm not, not agree with that. And also we interview um, different communities that are being impacted by the algorithm in order for them to know, um, in order for us to analyze exactly First thing, if the community knows that this algorithm is being applied, because for instance, we had a case in Spain, we have a case in one minute? Two, Two minutes, okay. Um, we have a case in Spain um, with a system that is applied, it's called Biogen and it's being applied um, from police forces and basically it's assigning risk to women um, who go to the police station and denounce a situation related to gender violence, pretty much cases related to domestic violence. Then they, like the case goes through this algorithm and the algorithm is assigning a risk to this woman and depending on the risk assigned, the police is going to take some measures or, or others. So this system hasn't been um, audited and that's really problematic. So we, when we went into being different women that have been passed the algorithm, they didn't know that this algorithm was deciding on her future or on their future um, and pretty much it's something of just like, live or dead, um, because it's a super crucial issue. So how can be that, like, how can this happen? Um, so that's why we, all, we always say, like, the, the impacted community takes a big part on the analysis of how these systems operate. Then we, I'm going, and related to that, um, that's why we call it socio-technical, because it's not only an analysis of the data um, and, and, like, the technical work or all of the algorithms or systems, but also we take into account this social context um, and how this is affecting people. I'll, I move to the second um, bullet point, it's basically civil society participation. We cannot do this um, uh, analysis without talking to the specific community that is working in the sector. So if, for instance, with the Biogen one, we've, we, we did the adversarial audit in collaboration with the Anna Bedia Foundation, that is a foundation working with women survivors of uh, gender violence in Spain, because they know how exactly, what is happening exactly with this community, and they have the access to the community uh, to make sure that we, we we listen to them or we hear them. Um, then moving to the third one, it needs to be periodic because any change to the system or any change in the context, it's important in terms of seeing if there's some potential discrimination or bias or some problem with the algorithm. So any change, like uh, the, let's say a proactive change that a company can do to a system, it's important to then pass an audit again, but also um, we live in a flexible and a super um, evolving context, so that's why we always say that this audit, it's not that you pass an audit and then you forgot, you need to pass it uh, periodically. Um, and then the, the last one is human oversight. Although parts of pretty much the internal methodology, not that uh, here I'm not that focused on the adversarial one, on the internal one, we always, we always focus on, um, there's some parts that can be automatized in terms of analyzing data, but there's other parts that never, or that we are not going to like try to automatize them because in terms of understanding the context it has to be a human being who can just like have the conversation with the other humans and understand how exactly can can impact so i think that i'm going to leave it here excellent um, yeah. Mirai, thank you thank very you. much for those comments maybe an applause indeed <laughs> thank you so if there's one or two questions of clarification, not discussion that requires an elaborate answer, then this is the time to ask. Yes, can we have a microphone, please? Not yet? No. Thank you. Um, 
maybe you have told us already, and I didn't hear, but um, who puts the uh, algorithms in a register? Everyone can put them. So there's a form. So we do our own research because of different conversations that when we know that there's some algorithm being applied, we check if, it's, if it, the algorithm is already in the register. In case it's not, we include them. Uh, we include the, the algorithm. And then there's a public form that anyone can access it and can just like, hey, here's three more algorithms that you can add. And then we add them. More similar questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Stefan Schollier from VUB. Welcome. Um, thanks. Uh, again, a question about the algorithms. Are they open access? No. It's okay. only for you to see and to evaluate. Depending. Adversarial audits, we publish all the information that we can get, for example. Um, because pretty much it's, it's based, like the methodology that we use is based on the public information that is already there. So it's basically putting all together and say, look, this is what we can find about this algorithm and here is our analysis and here are the results. So anyone has all the access. With internal auditing, depending on the company that we are working with. So there are companies that w they use it as a transparency exercise too. So then they publish, look, I did the audit and these are the conclusions and here is the methodology and everything that was done um, to analyze it. Um, and then there's other companies that they do not want to release any information. So it's like they, we do the, the, um, the audit, we say to them, like, obviously in terms of the conclusions, if they passed it or not, or if they just like go, uh, need to go check things before they pass the audit, but it is not used as a transparency tool, so they do not publish anything. That's up right now, that's up to the, to the company or the entity. Or, so if I understand correctly, uh, the reports and the audit are published, but not the algorithm, and they're not open access. Are they patented? The algorithm? Yeah, probably, yeah, probably, because like it's not our algorithm, so we don't have like we don't have the ownership of these algorithms. It's just like we checked others um, people's algorithms. Um, so that's, for instance, uh, like we publish all that we can publish. Um, but when we just like have a private conversation, it, it has to remain private. The good thing here is with the public administration in, in terms of ownership is super interesting because, for example, there's a big legal case now in Spain because the public administration doesn't want to release a cold source in this case uh, because um, they, they, it is, they say it is protected by intellectual property, but not public administration intellectual property because some de private developer has been in charge of developing this uh, system. So now it's quite funny because they, they added like this legal argument saying, no, it's, it's also because of um, public security. And we're just like public security for an algorithm that is deciding if you are going to just like uh, give or not like a, a public aid to just like vulnerable families who cannot afford uh, electricity in their home. So it's just like how does it impact public uh, security? So there's, the, there's mm -hmm. this big case because um, all, like all reports that uh, we have analyzing public administration algorithms pretty much are all adversarial audits because we've never done an, one like an internal one with the public administration. In all of them, we said just like public administration needs to reveal all of that or at least make sure that it has been checked because now it's not even checked. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, sorry, we I didn't mean to up. interrupt no, no, so yes. abruptly. Then we'll continue the discussion um, uh, after we hear the other presentations, and I encourage you to continue sending us your questions over Slido, unless you want to ask a question live in the room with a microphone, then you wait, of course. Now we move to the next presentation, which will be by Frank Victor Laurent. Please give him an applause, and let me remind you that he's... <laughs> co-founder of Wiquity. Hi, I'm Frank. I'm the co-founder of Wiquity. I'm just waiting for the slides to boot up. Um, great. So, so Wiquity designs AI solutions for uh, corporates and investors, especially in terms of ESG data collection and ESG reporting. Um, you can move to the next slides. Um, so today we have raised about 1.7 million. We're a team of 10. We're based in Brussels. We've partnered with a couple of uh, large Belgium corporates. 
and um, we build these solutions for them to, uh, for example, collect data from their own portfolio companies, help them um, uh, analyze their whole database to extract the right data points, uh, or for other co companies, help them do the whole ESG reporting and pre-filling of all ESG and compliance questionnaires. Uh, next slide, please. So what's ESG? And what, uh, what is more specifically ESG data? Well, ESG is the acronym of Environment, Social and Governance. Environmental data is, for example, GSG emissions data. Social data is more relating to health in the workplace, the number of injuries occurring in a company. Governance data can be related to board diversity, for example. Next slide. Uh, so what, why is it uh, very interesting data and why is it key for a very uh, important topic such as the climate transition is because ESG data can help, for example, identify climate risks and opportunities, can help assess the company's environmental impact, can help design mitigation strategies. And you can find ESG data in plenty of different sources, in annual reports, public database, sensors, even satellite data. Um, and the if ESG data is published in, in a very accurate way, and, and that's why, for example, CSRD, the EU, EU taxonomy makes full sense, it's because it helps perform an objective assessment of companies. If you're able to perform this correctly, you're able to uh, steer the uh, uh, sustainable funds towards the right companies. And that's why it's, uh, this is why we entered uh, ESG data and, and this sector is because we really believe that if we help companies and investors allocate the funds in the right direction, that will have a significant impact. Next slide. So you have many types of use cases for ESG data. Companies can use ESG data to identify climate risk, invest in green technologies to mitigate, for example, uh, GSG emissions. Investment funds um, can use ESG data to uh, compare and select environmentally uh, and socially responsible uh, companies uh, to invest in. Even governments can use ESG data to elaborate also carbon strategies. Next slide. So the, the, the big issue today in ESG data is the quantity of unstructured data. I've mentioned uh, annual reports and these kind of data, but these are quite easy data to, to treat. The more difficult data comes, for example, from satellite data, when you have plenty of, of, and plenty of data points, so when you have very large corporates, we've discussed with clients that have many, many subsidiaries in the whole world and they have different data points everywhere. And that's where we use AI. Next slide. So AI can help you do uh, multiple things. It can help you analyze these type of huge data uh, in a much more efficient way. It can help it uh, si really save time and uh, assess it in a much more objective and accurate uh, way. But it can also bring data in a much more timely manner. For example, at Wikwiti, we developed a data feed that could uh, scrape uh, social media and news in re near real time and detect ESG controversies so that portfolio managers can reallocate their assets based on these ESG controversies. It can be used for uh, also for compliance purposes where if you want to uh, market yourself as an ESG fund, you need to uh, follow a series of guidelines provided by uh, the EU, for example. Next slide. So at Wikwiti, we, we, we do uh, data collection. We've built solutions, uh, for example, that pre-fill automatically all of your ESG and compliance service based on your own internal data. Uh, we've built solutions that can analyze social media. We've built solutions that can uh, do ESG reporting for both corporates and private equity firms. Um, next slide. But what's, what we've seen today as the main challenges when applying AI is... Um, three different things but that, that are really linked together. The first one is customer trust and user adoption. It's really difficult to uh, make sure that large corporates actually trust the results of the AI. And we need to also build confidence and kind of educate the client towards what's AI, 
AI, how is it used, why can it be accurate? And that's directly linked to the second challenge we have, which is model transparency. How do we make sure that uh, the, 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 um, the answer of the AI is actually accurate? For example, at Wikwiti, what we do is we systematically provide a source, we provide reasoning, and we provide a confidence level. And there's always uh, uh, the ability for the user to do a manual verification. We show the source, we show uh, the confidence, and then based on these types of parameters, the client can uh, do a self-assessment and ask someone to do a double check. The last point, which is also a, a big challenge at SWIC, which is data security. So of course, ESG data can be public data, non-confidential data, but can also be private and very confidential data. Let's take, for example, gender pay gap. If you want to compute gender pay gap, you need data points from all your subsidiaries and from all employees' salaries. These are the kinds of data that are very confidential. And that's why at Wikwiti, what we try to do is provide full GDPR compliance, uh, full ISO uh, compliance, but it's always a question of customer trust. Um, Next slide. Um, so I was asked what are the possible opportunities of AI in sustainable finance? Well, I think there's many, many types of opportunities. Uh, I think in general, um, what we've seen today up until now is that there are a handful of large ESG data providers in the world, mostly American, that uh, take that make these ESG ratings based on what corporates disclose about themselves. Often these data is unaudited. And I think the, the main interest of AI is that you can process lots and lots of types of data sources, uh, alternative data sources from media, it can be satellites. Uh, for example, you could use satellite data to analyze uh, the impacts of a corporate project on deforestation. These are the types of data that were not processed before in these ESG ratings. And using AI, you can provide a much more accurate and a 360 view of the ESG performance of a company. I see two other opportunities, but are, these are more specific and really linked to these enhanced ESG metrics. These are green bonds and climate risks. You know, green bonds are, of course, very, very interesting today, but it's quite difficult to verify the green credentials of those. And that's where I, I, I believe can have a huge impact. Same for climate risks. Banks need to take these climate risks into account today, but often these, uh, these banks, they just want to be compliant, right? So they just take the basic data sets they find, uh, they buy it, and then that's it. But today with AI, you can add much more layers, uh, much more 360 degree view, adding different types of data sources, which make the uh, climate risk, I believe, much more uh, objective and much more comparable. Thank you very much. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. <clears throat> A quick informative question for Frank Victor. Mike, please. Okay, we have two. We'll start here and then we'll go to the other side. Please introduce yourself to the audience and then tell yes. us. Yes, hello. I'm Agnese Papadi. I work for the European Commission. Um, I have one question. You said, I mean, you use AI to collect data, but is there a sort of weighting to give a weight of, to the data depending on the source? I mean, if they're provided by the company themselves or if you find them through other means? Is, do you do that? Yes, definitely. So, so uh, we have one solution. So this ESG media screening um, can provide a different weighting based on the types of source. So this is very subjective, right? We have seen plenty of databases that provide this kind of uh, credibility per source, per news source, per, uh, per uh, social media account and these kind of things. So these are very subjective things. But what we often hear from clients is that they want the data, but they want to do the weighting themselves. So we provide kind of a an API, an, 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 uh, an IT interface that enables them to have the raw data and then put the weighting themselves. We, of, of course, provide a default weighting, but we enable them to customize it because we think that they have their own methodology and that they want to customize it for their own needs. We have a question here. Hi, Dana Verbal, also from the European Commission. Um, I, I hope I managed to formulate this in a clear way because it's not clear in my head. 
do you think that the, your clients are also uh, interested in uh, using your AI just as a way of uh, of showing uh, their uh, their investors that they qualify with some very minimum requirements? And related to that, do you think there could be some perverse effects such as social washing? Because you mentioned that healthcare in the workplace is an indicator of the social uh, criterion, but that could also be an indicator that people in that company uh, are afraid to take sick leave because they might be fired. So do you, um, Kate, like, did you test this, uh, this algorithm against such a situation? A question from Slido that ties right into this is uh, not social washing, but green washing. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you can take that into account as well. For sure. Um, so f many types of answers based on different types of solutions. So in terms of uh, ESG media screening, the main concern was about green washing. And so indeed, uh, and I, I can relate to what has been said before, you need a human layer at the end. So what we provide is we collect the data, we show it in an, in an interface, we, we show these types of, of trends and issues and controversies that, that come in, and then we enable the portfolio manager, the ESG manager to, to assess it by himself. So indeed, there might be lots of greenwashing, right? Uh, especially in social media, you have many com B2C companies are much more public facing and they're more susceptible to these kind of things. Um, so these are the things that we, we show in the platform. We try to put a weighting. We try to, to make sure that if the data comes from a source that is from the company itself, we, we take uh, a very lower uh, lower the weighting of it. Um, but of course, you need a human layer. This is only one type of data feed. You need to combine it with lots of other types of data feeds. And we are not, unfortunately, the solution to uh, stop greenwashing. So that's for the ESG media screening. For ESG reporting, I think that um, you mentioned companies uh, which want to show the minimum. I, from what I've seen on uh, when working with huge corporates and, and private equity firms, most of them actually want to do the bare minimum because they see this as uh, an extra burden and financial burden. And in the beginning, we, we wanted to help them to, to uh, improve their metrics and, and really have a very proactive approach. And most of them were not interested actually because they were like, what can you do to uh, make sure that I'm compliant with the regulation? And as uh, I just came out at the, of university at this point, I was very idealistic. I was like, yeah, sustainable funds, they are very proactive. They want to change the world. It's, it's, that's not the reality. The reality is that all these ESG funds, they are ESG because they want to have more investors. And uh, a way to do this is just to become ESG because you can get much more money. And I think it's also, it's, it's not uh, the role of maybe uh, these actors or, or a role of a startup like ours. It's, uh, I think what changes the game are regulations, are CSRD, SFDR, and these kind of regulations that can increase really uh, that would will indeed increase a bit the burden for companies but that will increase the standards for companies and private equity firms because they will do the bare minimum so if you can increase the standards you make sure but then you apply ai to make sure that the burden is is as low as possible and that, that it costs uh, the bare minimum for them mm. but you make sure that you you have this uh, standard level that is applicable Excellent. once we give you oh Let's, I suggest we save that um, for sure. thought for the Q&A at the end. Let's quickly move on. Please give Frank Victor an applause, of course. <laughs> Maria Lisa and Lina, your presentation. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have had uh, two IT experts. Ville Pitkakangas and Ville Peltola also with us working. Uh, we had uh, we have made uh, we have working been working in Lyhty project in English uh, something make, maybe something like that uh, lighthouse project. Mm. And what we have uh, done here waiting uh, our slides still. Um, we have next one, I think so. Um, 
let's focus on uh, field-specific sick leave data and AE. Um, our aim in that LUTU project was forecasting and preventing short uh, time sick leaves by analyzing and combining sick leave data with open data sources, for example, weather or quality of air, uh, that kind of things. Mm. Our project I'm aimed also developing health and well-being services with field-specific data uh, from seven different fields. Our aim was uh, also support data-based admini administration and management. Next one. Uh, shortly about results. We analyzed uh, data uh, between years 2018 and 2022, uh, almost uh, 51,000 entries from, from seven fields, as I said. Um, and we identified uh, common sick leave and um, our interests uh, were uh, time periods, um, duration of sick leaves, um, which uh, day of week uh, was most common, uh, or which month, and uh, field specific, specific causes and risks were considered and correlations with open data. Um, yes, for example, big sport events. Uh, and in the project, we developed uh, 10 well-being services, or we didn't with Lena, uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, did, did that. And there are, for example, uh, relaxing exercises, exercises um, in nature, in forest maybe, um, and during COVID time also online ex exercises. Uh, companies which uh, took part, um, they receive, received data to improve workplace safety and well-being. Yeah, and uh, I just mentioned the picture here is from the Finnish in Institute of Occupational Health and they are actually holding a huge data bank of uh, work well-being related data and we actually published all of the data that we produced and the analysis of it there. So uh, I, I know that finding the right data for innovation is a challenge and I think that this kind of data sets are a really awesome way of innovating in the future. So uh, that's from there. But we can go to the next slide and a few words about how we use the data that we had. Uh, we collected it from multiple sources, so either from the company's databases or the occupational health service providers' uh, databases, and we used various methods to analyze this data. And uh, one uh, kind of a challenge or something that we could change in the future was that uh, for each storage we had to have a separate way of analyzing the data. And the process, in, in short, was that at first all the personal information was anonymized. So we only used like uh, anonymous sets of data. And we used the absences that lasted less than uh, 10 days. So longer than that was uh, out of it uh, because that was our research topic. But we also knew that uh, longer than uh, or short sick leaves are a sign of longer sick leaves in the future. So if we can prevent those in the beginning stages when it is less than 10 days, then we can actually also react to the longer sick leaves as well. 
the data that we had left uh, was categorized by the variables such as the diagnosis, either on a specific diagnosis or a diagnosis group. And uh, we did the distributions to the dates and months and days of the week and uh, all of that. And then we used the external variables, which are the open data, which, which was part of the innovation that, that we uh, developed here. And I will talk about that soon. Um, but in general, in general, the correlations and associations we could find, uh, we used uh, widely used metrics and uh, forecasts for that. But we, of course, had to develop it for this specific uh, project. Uh, on top of this, we also developed forecasting of short sick leaves. Uh, that was ki kind of in the end of the project when we had the analysis of different fields. And uh, we uh, were able to do it, but I'm sure you can all guess that the shorter the time that we are trying to forecast, the better the result is. But at the same time, uh, we as people can guess if we will be sick tomorrow or not <laughs> in most cases. So AI can do the same. Uh, so we started to develop that uh, in, in the project. Um, yeah, next slide. So uh, about the data collection, uh, like I mentioned, we gather them from the employers or the occupational health services, and we did that yearly. So we got one year of result at once. Uh, they came in different formats, uh, which, which was part of the work that we had to do to align and make the data comparable. Uh, but then we used open sources for uh, comparing this information with what was going on in the world. So that was, for example, weather information, the air quality, um, infections and like pandemics, epidemics that were going on at the moment. Uh, but uh, And then like sport events and other events, if they have an effect. Uh, but we also had more specific data, for example, about the physical activity during a work day, which was another research project that we could uh, combine the data. Uh, most of the data we gathered was, like I said, on a yearly basis, uh, but we also could uh, gather real-time well-being data from an app called Your Day at Distance, which is actually still available and we are now working on it uh, regarding remote work and there will be a chance for you to download it as well. But yeah, that, that's about the data collection. So next slide. Okay, uh, key takeaways. Um, what were the Sussexes? How many minutes still? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's hurry. Um, uh, maybe creating knowledge out of data was one success. Uh, combining m multitude of different data, that also. And then I think Lena can go on. So yeah. So about the challenges, like I mentioned, the separate data storages was one of the challenges. And of course, this is really sensitive data that we are working on. One big thing is the data literacy of the stakeholders. Like Maria Lisa mentioned, uh, we had the small entrepreneurs developing uh, services through this data and how they have the skills to do that is something really challenging. But yeah, next slide. Uh, best, best practices, um, prevention of health issues for individuals and work communities is, is maybe the best practice and, and um, triangular collaboration, uh, occupational uh, health organizations, employers, employees, uh, service providers, it's, it's uh, one best practice, one of the best things in our project, I think so. And I think that um, this um, is very interesting for every one of us because um, 50,000 50, so, uh, short sick leaves costs uh, uh, free over 31 million. Yes, so. yes, it's it's a lot of money, and we could make uh, with that um, many many nice things. I yeah. think so. Yeah. So uh, next slide. 
uh, about the next steps. I think this is something we can have a lot of Q and A's about, but uh, maybe the, uh, one of the main things is that if we can gather the data continuously, and I would bring up, bring up also data economy and blockchain as a tool of understanding the data that we have, how do we share it and what are the permits there and how we make sure that it doesn't okay. change. Yeah. That, Excellent. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions of clarification before we move to the general Q&A? Uh, thank you. Ruth Passaman, Working European Commission. I'm sorry, I didn't understand, I think, the last step. So I understand yeah. everything that you do, but how does this, what do employers do with this data? I mean, what, what, yeah, what happens after you've collected the information? Yeah, uh, we analyzed the data on a field specific level. So we had really different sizes of companies. Some had thousands of- Maybe it'll help, it help me at least, and perhaps part of the audience, if you uh, define what is field specific. Oh, yeah. So uh, the seven fields were, for example, teaching, expert work, okay. uh, industrial work, <laughs> su such uh, jobs. And uh, we provided the data on a field specific level and then had discussions with the companies uh, that how do you use this data? What will you do next to uh, support your employees to either not get sick or then if it is, for example, an epidemic uh, that you may have to prepare uh, people to cover for the ones that are sick. So that's more of a HR uh, side of it. So uh, that's it. We had this triangular system that we talk with the employer, with the employee and also the occupational health uh, service okay. providers. Excellent. Let's take one more question of clarification. And I encourage you to keep sending your questions on yeah. Slido. After this, we open the floor for a general discussion, of course. Yes. Great. What's your name? Uh, hi, my name is Leva. I work for the European AI Society Fund. Um, my Welcome. question is in relation, actually, to the kind of panel that was before, right, on algorithms at workplace. You mentioned that you use an app to collect, like, a real-time well-being data. How do you go around the privacy, or how do you really work with the companies that use this and collect uh, this data from the workers to make sure that their rights are not violated. And also give us an idea, again, I might be misunderstanding, but so it's an application that individuals have. Uh, yeah, the app was one part of the data that we gathered. So the yeah. main part was... And, the then, and then people have to report themselves, how they are feeling, yeah. or how. give us an example. What's the question exactly. that the app, uh, app asks? Uh, the app asks first that how was your day? You can tell it was good. And then you have bad, options to pick then, from? Yeah, then there is specific questions about, it can be about the ergonomics or the work community, or did your colleague say hi to you in the morning? Like really And what's the response questions. rate? Sorry? What's the response rate? So how many people respond how often? Uh, we are expecting answers every day. And uh, during the project, uh, do you remember how many uh, staff members the company had? It was mm, about 2,000. Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. obviously everyone will not answer every day. Not everyone. We cannot okay. So how do you deal with the data privacy issue? Yeah, so uh, in that case as well, the data was anonymized. So uh, we have only the connection to the device that they were answering, uh, but all the results were disconnected from, from the person. And uh, the team leaders and the management will only get an anonymous analysis of the, of the results, and then they uh, go through it all together uh, in, in the group. So there is no personal responses that we would okay. gather at all. Excellent. Maya, Lisa and Lina, an applause, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Um, let's take one question from Slido and then turn to the room. This is a very nice sort of general question that anyone on the panel could respond to, I guess. Uh, would it be possible to have universal basic income and a four days work week? Um, hold on. Oh, yeah, the question jumped with the AI revolution. What steps are being done right now to make it happen? Um, yeah. Um, Any thought is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's 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 an interesting concept. I've I've seen in in Silicon Valley. I think OpenAI is working on this. They have a think tank on this. Um, I'm really not an expert on this, but I. Um, I do think that 
this might really have a strong impact on lots of types of jobs. I'm looking mainly at lawyers because that's what I studied. Um, and I've seen lots of different use cases where we could indeed apply AI. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to replace in some way humans and, and reduce the, the work time. This might be possible, but it's definitely not my area of expertise. But I think that it might definitely change the way people work today. I'm looking especially at lawyers. Today, uh, large parts of, of, the, of, of the day of a power legal, for example, is making searches and these kind of things. These are the types of things where we can see AI uh, significantly helping them. You're echoing the point that uh, Mr. Pissori just made, the uh, Nobel Prize laureate yesterday. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Let's turn to the room. Raise your hand, and I'll prioritize those who didn't speak yet. So I'll start with the gentleman with the uh, um, orange lanyard. Where did you get that one? Oh, OK. Many people have it. All right. Yeah, I'm not the only one. <laughs> So, uh, Luca Lacroix from uh, Renew Group. Um, I have a question uh, for um, Ms. De Salsa. Mireia. Yeah. Mireia. Um, so, uh, specifically on, on human oversight, um, there's a lot of discussion around that, and I wanted to, uh, to know uh, because o obviously, from the side of, of uh, civil society, we hear a lot about, you know, we need more oversight. Um, but I wanted to hear uh, against the argument, uh, pragmatic argument of a lot of administrations that say, look, we have a very thin budget, we are stretched thin, we don't have enough people. We actually want to use AI to reduce the workload and have less people and, and, um, and be able to deal with the workload and not be super late, like a lot of administrations are, like justice is in Belgium. Um, what, what, what would you say to that, to like, you know, the, uh, about human oversight and sometimes, you know, the four eyes principle uh, that you need two people yeah. checking and things like that? It's, how do you, you know, handle yeah. this conflict? The question is uh, clear to you, Mirai. Yes. Okay, excellent. Michael? Okay. Um, so I guess my, my thinking behi behind that is just like, it's okay to use an algorithm or it's okay to use an artificial intelligence system if you want to be more efficient because at some point there's some situation that can be just like help you and just like help to not have this burden of uh, really like a lot of work. Um, for instance, with, uh, for example, the electrical bonus that they uh, give uh, by the Spanish, the, the Spanish public administration, it's just like checking if you have these conditions that are established by law. So it's not that there's like some subjective thinking behind that you can say, or just like you can assess the situation and say, if this should be this a solution or this other one. It's, if you have these requirements, you have the aid, the public aid. If you don't, you don't. So in this case, it's okay to use algorithm. Our thinking uh, with all of that, it's like, it's okay to use it if you audit it and you make sure that it's, not, it's, it's going to work well. So at, like there's some points, for example, for instance, I don't think that there's some human oversight needed while this algorithm is checking if you are going to receive this public aid or not. But if some um, low income family that is um, relying that is going to have this public aid and the algorithm is saying, no, you are not going to have it, then is there any mechanism in place for a human to review the process in the case that you are not agreeing with the output. In this case in Spain, right now, it is not. So if the algorithm says A, the result is going to be A, no matter if you think that, I don't know, there's been some mistake checking your salary and for instance, uh, the quantity established there is not the right one. So our thing is it's okay to use it if you have a thinking behind of that and if you pass this guarantees that you need to make sure that you pass them in order to make sure that there's no negative impact. Um, so maybe in case of refusal, then it should be, there should be an oversight, but... Yes, it depends on the system. For example, the Biogen one, it, it goes directly to a thing that it's super, like, it's a com complex thing because um, the woman uh, who goes to the police station and denounces a situation at the moment that you denounce it, if the situation like has happened just like one hour before, probably you are in a mental disorder chalk. So probably you are not like well to just like think probably the, the answers that uh, you need to give to the policy, uh, to the police. And the police, like the, the information that is uh, coming like or introduced to Biogen, it's yes or no to different, like to a big questioner. The yes or no is not decided by the woman. The woman is going to just like being asked, um, in this situation, you were hit by whatever. Um, and then 
the police officer is, is going to just establish yes or no. And maybe there's some gray zones there. Well, I was not hit, but I was done by these other things. So in that situation, it's the police officer subjectively saying this is, this, this is yes or this is no. And here there's a sub subjectivity. Um, so then why are we assigning, because another, like, an another point here, you know, it's just like if a system is being used and this system, for example, in Spain we have like uh, the public administration have to, um, has to uh, pass an audit for decisions that are completely automatized but not for the semi-automatized ones. Doesn't make any sense, but okay. Um, what happens with the biogen? The biogen risk is followed more than the 90, I think that was 90, 95% of the cases, but it's not fully automatized because it's a police officer who decides exactly the protective measures that we are going to receive based on the risk that is assigned by biogen. Well, excuse me, but 90, 95% of the cases following the risk assigned by the algorithm, it's practically automatized, the decision. Yeah. So in that situation too, it's, it's, it's where we need to just like think before applying the system and pass an, an, uh, this audit because in our audit, for example, there's also this part of, of context on why are you deciding to apply this system? Is the output that it's, this system is going to, be, to generate, it's better than the, the status quo that we have now or not? Is this a particular situation what, that we need to apply this system because with the bonuses, like the bonus, like the electrical bonus, my trick answer would, I would say yes, because it's just like checking some characteristics that are established by law. So there's no subjectivity that is going to go in. But then for the Biogen situation, right. I don't know, maybe like having civil society organizations involved in the conversation would be great before a public administration decides to apply without anything in behind uh, the algorithm. Thanks a lot for that elaborate answer. I'll take another question from Slido, the one that's been voted as uh, the favorite question of the audience. How big is the risk that sick leave data is used to identify people more likely to be on long-term sick leave? Does this not give an incentive to fire people? Let me create a more concrete example out of this. We know various researches have been done that women in a certain age category are sometimes not hired or when there's an opportunity to fire them, they are fired because there's a greater likelihood that they get pregnant. Obviously, with the AI revolution and collecting all of this data, we'll have even more granular information about such things. I can't think of another example, but AI will give us those examples. So there's a risk, obviously, here. And even if the data cannot be tracked back to a particular individual, it will give us an idea of the collective. And perhaps, and this is also um, a discussion that we have in privacy law, you don't trust, trace it back to the individual, but you have a lot of information about the collective in a few hands. How do you look at these risks? What do we do with them? It's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the risk is uh, of course there, and it was there already before AI was uh, existing. We we could recognize that uh, some people are off and away, and then uh, the sick leaves get longer. And uh, I would kind of turn my head here towards the uh, public actors who could be kind of the neutral actors here in gathering the data and then providing the analysis and providing like a space of discussion and what does this mean for my field and for my company. So, um, like I mentioned, in Finland we have the Institute of Occupational Health, but on a European level there is, for example, the European Agency for Safety and Health at work. And uh, we uh, considered that uh, we, for example, didn't give any company-specific data to any company. We didn't even give a city-specific data to a city, because we live in a small city, that would be kind of uh, easy to recognize. Uh, at the same time, I, I realized that uh, a, sp a company who maybe wants to have this as a service, get, get the information of their company, they really want it only about their own company, wi which makes the amount of data a lot less. And we, we saw this already, but we were able to do it on a field-specific level. Right. And that, that's what I would call for in the future as well. It can be on a European level or a Finnish level or whichever. And then the second important thing is that we discuss about the results of the analysis and we also think what we want to get out of it. This was just the first project uh, about it that we were doing. There is a lot more opportunities on what to do. But again, it requires the person there. 
so uh, that, that's the way I consider the safety of it. Uh, it will not ma make the risk disappear, but like I said, the risk is there anyway, even if we don't have AI. <laughs> right. Frank, Victor, could you chip in on this one? Yes, for sure. What, what do you think? What should we do with this, uh, with this issue that I formulated a bit ago? Um, ah, I need to have a think. Uh, but Excellent. I was, not, I was thinking about another question. I, I've seen there, so it's... No worries. Thanks <laughs> a lot for that. Let's turn back to the room. I'll take the gentleman over there. Yes, that's you. Hello. Thank you very much, everybody, for your presentation. It's really inspiring. And uh, even more in the social economy sector, because we all know that we lack of skills, we lack of uh, digital capacity in our social uh, economy. Um, but still, uh, we are the best in doing our job. So, for example, because I'm from, I didn't present myself, uh, I've, I forgot. Um, I'm uh, Freddy Jussien, I'm from the European Association of Service Providers for People with uh, Disabilities. Welcome. Um, and I, uh, yeah, so I just said that, of course, we lack of digital capacities, etc. but uh, we are the best in doing our job. So, for example, in my field, uh, care workers, um, are the best for including people with disability while respecting the UN Convention uh, of People with Disability, for example. So my question is, uh, how do you cooperate with uh, the social economy actors in your work? So, for example, um, while writing a report on uh, ESG, cooperate with the social economy to, for example, identify where is the social washing? Or when you design audit, how do you co cooperate with social economy actors? And same for, for, for data collection. So we lack of capacity, but we are demanding. Uh, we demand collaboration with you, with uh, the, the, the digital qualified person. So. Here's my question. Th thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent question. Thank you very much. Who wishes to respond to that one? I can go. Please yes, I briefly, can. please, so we can have a little okay. more. Um, so basically, now the micro. Okay. Um, as I already mentioned, um, civil society collaboration is like one of the main parts. So we c we cannot do an adversarial audit, for instance, if we do not have any entity that wants to collaborate. Apart that, we include ourselves more from the part of the non-for-profit side of the work, like to the social economy and, and with all, like we work together with all of these actors. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing. And then um, as one of the main parts of the audits are understanding the societal context in which a system operates, we don't have the expertise. We have the expertise on analyzing a system but we don't have the expertise of the concrete sector or the concrete context. So if we don't collaborate with exactly the people that is living in this context, we cannot analyze anything pretty much because we don't know the challenges that they are facing, if how this is being applied within their community, if they have participated or not in the decision-making processes of implementing such an algorithm. So this is like the key um, to understand, or at least for the adversarial audit ones, to understand exactly, um, so to reverse engineer or to do this exercise and just like seeing how this system possibly works, right. it's like key uh, to collaborate with uh, the impacted community. And that always means to collaborate with uh, civil society. Excellent. Thank you very much. Please raise your hand if you wish to contribute at this point. In that case, I will take the gentleman who already spoke once for another one. And then I'll turn to Slido. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, OK, so Lina. Um very good projects, by the way, and very good uh, ideas. Uh, Lina, did you identify the effects of sick leave? Did you identify? The effects okay. of, sick, of sick leave. Like on the individual or the company? On the individual, the reasons. Uh, yes, we identify the diagnosis either on a specific level or in a group level. But obviously, if there is very few of some diagnosis, we uh, did not publish it. It was immediately deleted from the data. The interesting right. part is, did you correlate it to specific external factors? Specific 
external, external factors. factors. Like you said that you're measuring the weather, you're seeing uh, mm. like ah. kind of indicators. Do you correlate it, the data of yeah. the cyclic yeah. to some effects? Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. So, for example, the air quality uh, had obviously effect on like uh, uh, lung and flu <laughs> related uh, sicknesses. And then we had a lot of information for, again, the field specific level. So, uh, for example, in uh, teaching and expertise work, uh, mental health diagnoses were common. And on uh, this like kindergarten teaching level, mm -hmm. like uh, stomach issues were common. And o on this level, Level we we did, but of course not in a more specific level than that. Yeah, I ask because th there's a, uh, a lot of policy implications that can be found, and also if you can calculate how much funding or costs are related to this, you can advocate for better policies mm -hmm. in relation to air pollution mm -hmm. or air quality or other. Things. Set your priorities right, etc. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, uh, Frank. Uh, Victor, what question did you have in mind? I'm really curious now. Uh, no, I was looking at ESG data, and then what would you like to see done by policymakers? Um, so that's that's the fourth one. Yeah, ex uh, the third one. Sorry. Yeah. What would you like to see done? What would you like to see done by, po by policymakers? Exactly related to AI. I was thinking about training training data and copyrights, um, especially. Um, I've seen lots of types of AI tools today, and I was shocked about the quality of it, but also, but where's the data coming from? We've seen some model generating uh, images, for example, and then uh, when you type in certain prompts, you see that the image contains a very small label saying stock image, but it's not exactly like this. And so what's interesting there is that you, you, we can see that the, the training data comes from copyrighted content. And I think that's today a very, one of the biggest issues I've seen today, especially as, as having a background in law, I've seen this and I was like, how is this even possible? How, how do we, we use contents created by artists to replace their own content with their own content without even paying them. And I think that's today a big issue. I know that it's uh, already, uh, we already have a couple of, uh, uh, these issues were raised already in the US. Uh, I'm wondering definitely by the EU, but this is something that I was really um, a bit shocked, I would say, um, and especially training our own models. We use public data, we, we, we check that it's not copyrighted, of course, otherwise we, we don't even have access to it. Uh, but I think that's quite, quite, uh, quite an interesting topic. To Thanks a lot. The last question I'll take from Slido, my apologies, it's time considerations. Um, and uh, this one is also voted for a number of times. What was the best implementation of an ethical use of AI you have seen so far? And I'd like to challenge you to make this brief, the response, and as concretely as possible. What is it? What does it do? Why is it good? Who wants to start? <laughs> Not that easy yet to answer that. You are um, excellent speakers. <laughs> um, so first thing, we, we don't consider ethical use we like to just like mention responsible use because we are not ethical i mean being an ethicist is more complex than just like doing algorithmic auditing um so we like to see like we like to give it like more a proper name so we after some system passes an audit we call it like it's a responsible system it's a responsible company that has taken the steps the steps to make sure that there's no harm um, in society. Then I can mention two, two cases. One is, one Just is, one. okay, one. In Spain, there's a, there's a journalist um, fellow from like, uh, well, from a network of fellows that she has developed a, a system to uh, combat fake news. And it, it quite works. Um, they passed all the, they passed all the mechanisms or checkpoints that right now we are just like risk assessment, impact assessment. So it's just like a combination of all of that because legislation is or regulation is not there yet but they are taking the the steps um to make it just like um to make sure that there's no harms associated and in terms of efficiency um it really works and it's super quick, super like quick. just like sending a news through a whatsapp um group and then automatically you receive if the all the information in the article is right or or it's fake fantastic i'll ask now the tech team to show us the word cloud question. 
to wrap up the discussion. Die, please, uh, please join us on Slido. Have a look at... Bitte the, am I being addressed or is this AI being really scary? <laughs> Identify yourself. Voice. Now it's gone. What do we need to make sure AI works for people and not against them? What do we need to make sure AI works for people and not against them? So this is a word cloud. Your answer should not be an elaborate sentence, but try to have, I don't know, three, four words. I'll give you a free mo few moments. Yes, let's keep the screen here. And I'll benefit from this time to tell you that we have a coffee break after this breakout session and then the next one will start and please try to be on time. Guardrails, interdisciplinary teams, clarity, equity, cooperation, ethics by design. We need humans, duh. <laughs> It seems many of you have chosen that. Transparency, quite large. Auditing, AI use code of conduct. Yes, that's a good one. European regulations. Let me guess, you work for the EU. <laughs> <laughs> we can't trace it back to the individual, don't worry. <laughs> we, we can't, right? Just double checking. No. <laughs> have a rights-based approach, social data considerations, which we discussed today a human-centered approach, legislation, obviously, being worked on, as we've discussed elaborately yesterday, involvement of the community, and oversight. Keep sending us your input, while I'll turn to the members of the panel to share their reflections on this question, perhaps also the answers that you've seen there. Um, let me see, in this case, because we haven't heard from you for a while, and please try to keep it short, um, Maria Lisa, your final words. My final words. Um, I think uh, by using big data and AI, uh, we can make better working conditions. Yes. Excellent. It's a possibility. I like that. She has a doctorate in economics, so keeps being objective. It's a possibility. It could also go the other way around. Thanks a lot. Yeah, uh, I agree with the interdisciplinary teams that was mentioned there. That was right. also something we were doing. And I would also like to mention uh, there was the Association uh, for Disabilities that I would l uh, like to raise the NGOs, the third sector, the associations, as the people who can bring up the underdeveloped or the vulnerable positioned people uh, so we can kind of uh, not have these biases that we are having at the moment. So you don't really need to know about technology to really develop and give a really super important value to mm. developing AI. And that's something that I wish we see more in the future. And that will, I'm sure it will help at like uh, uh, maintaining the risks at bay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mireya, your brief response. Um, yes, yeah, so pretty much what I mentioned already, we need an ecosystem of grantees in place um, in order to make sure that any technological process that we are in as a worker, as a, like any role and profile in society, um, there's no harm or discrimination associated to the system. So ecosystem of grantees. Excellent. Frank Victor. Yeah, I'm, f I'm fully aligned with the, the three keywords, transparency, European regulations, humans. I think that regulations will be needed um, to make sure that the AI is safe, but we need also to make sure that the AI is explainable, transparent, and always accompanied by humans. Thank you very much for this excellent discussion. I'd like to thank the tech team that was helping us out. I'd like to thank the um, uh, European Commission colleagues for their excellent organization of this panel. And on my personal behalf, I thank Margaret for the fantastic collaboration. I thank all of you for your participation. And please join me in thanking our excellent speakers. And after that, I set you off for coffee. Thank you. Thank you.